to explain it. It's a, a picture from a book called Matière Grise uh, from Encore Heureux, which is a company in Paris. And so this one shows the, do you see my mouse here? Do you see this little? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So this shows um, um, on an um, example of wood. So I have a tree and when a tree gets cut down, I can make wood out of it. And out of the wood, I can make a door. And when that door breaks, then there are sort of different ways what can happen with the, the material here. So I could basically fix that door and put it back in place where it was. Like from a energetic or a sustainability point, this is probably the best choice. I could also um, cut it or fix it and put it in a different place. So that would be uh, re-emploi in, uh, in French. Or I could uh, basically use the wood sort of um, and turn it in an industrial process and make another product out of it. So this would be the recycling. Uh, recycling always uses energy and has an industrial process um, as a part of it. I could also um, burn it, which happens a lot. So it's called energetic um, reuse or whatever, <laughs> energetic use. And then uh, in the worst case, it would um, be dumped. And um, when what, we tr what we're trying to do in our office now is that we basically work in, in this field. So we either try to keep the, the elements where they are or the whole buildings and fix them or now these newer projects, we basically use material that comes from somewhere else and we create something new with that material. And for us, the, the topic of reuse can happen on, on uh, several levels. So the highest level basically is, a, is, a, is at the level of a whole industrial site. So this is a picture of a factory outside of Basel. They used to make textiles for centuries. And then the industry got moved to Eastern Europe and all of these buildings were supposed to be torn down. And then there were um, basically artists living in these uh, buildings and they had rented the space temporarily. And they were the ones that then sort of stood up and said, OK, we do not want to lose these buildings. This is a part of our heritage here in our little town. This was a little town where basically over the centuries, almost from every family, a person has worked in this company. So for them, it was really... Uh, there was a strong bond somehow and um, they stood up and they made a petition and so on. And so in the end, the, the, they actually approached our office if we could help. And we found then somebody who bought it, who, who ended up buying the whole site. And um, we've been supporting them developing these existing buildings into uh, new new uses and and you can see it's interesting because historically reuse was always there right it was never um we never had the luxury so to say to just tear everything down and make everything new this is just this is just the, the habit for like a few decades because really if you look back this building is coming from the 1800s and then they have added 1917 1965 19 1961, 1972. Now we are working with these and they are adding new housing now here in the end. So so this is more the way we like to think of things is that they just continue growing rather than being totally replaced. And and on a on a level of an individual building, so this is a, a building now in Basel, the impact hub, a building from the 90s. These buildings are, you know, on the first site, they are very much 
we don't like them anymore. You know, they're kind of like boring and that was just, you know, it's his, it's history, but the history isn't far back enough so that we appreciate them. But I think on, um, under these new environmental constraints that we have, um, we should really reconsider what can we do with buildings like that? Um, how can we work with them? What are sort of the characteristics and how can we how can we work with them? So this is a, a project I'll show you later what we did with that one. Now we are basically on the level of a, a building component. So this is the level of a whole uh, building site, the level of an individual building, the level of a building component. And here I'm going to talk just about material materials as as the lower level. Um, just to go back to the whole overview. But here the, on the building component, we see this is our office here in Basel and it used to be a, a, a hall, a machine uh, factory hall. So this is on one on this site in Basel on the Gundeldinger Feld and we moved in there in this hall. And um, this is me actually here. <laughs> and just a few back, a few years back, we started to um, use the height of this hall to add more workspace. Um, we were running out of space and we built basically that was more project that we did ourselves uh, in the office. We found this old um, system. Uh, it was sort of a storage system out in Pratteln and uh, that was been taken out and thrown away. So we, we took all these, um, this basically storage system and added another structure and then made this two, added these two stories in our own office now to have more people work here and have more space. And this is also a building on the Gundeldinger Feld. It's, a, it's the old silo, so it's, we used to have the coal, the coal in it that um, heated the whole um, industrial site. And we transformed this building also into offices. And I'm, I'm showing this here because this is the um, elevator shaft. And here on the level of a pure material, we collected these material, um, steel and, and polycarbonate from other sites and made this enclosure um on on this site so um if if we continue working with um existing sites we have um different strategies so we try to usually try to keep a maximum of the existing building but it doesn't mean that we cannot continue um, working with this site so we can still uh, add, we can add to the site, we can add building elements and we can take building elements away um, in order to ad adopt uh, or adjust the, 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 the buildings and the sites to the new needs we have. So as an example, I show you um, a site in, in Zurich, this is the work of bins and what we did here is um, as you can see here on this little pictogram so when we have existing mm, buildings that have let's say a high volume like like the office building I showed you our own office we can add layers right and so just by adding a layer or a floor uh, is, a, is a way to put it a bit simplified you can basically reduce the energy consumption per square meter by half just because you double you double the the floorage right the, the floor space in that building so this is a strategy if you have a, a tall building if you don't have a, a tall building you, you might be able to just add a story which we've done here so this the original building was that it was um a werkstätte so the uh, people would um, manufacturer in here and so we added on top we added a story 
uh, with offices. So we, we keep this and it, it has a different temperature zone, so we don't have to do much here, but we sort of put a warm hat on the on the building. Um, and and densify and and uh, make and make space for this uh, office building, or like in this case, we can densify. We can uh, make an addition to existing buildings. So this is what happened here. We put in this uh, wood uh, construction. So this is all artists' um, atelier, and there it's like a wooden wood element and um this wall here basically is a reuse material that was on site before so this was a, a roof of a shed so where this building is now there used to be a shed and that was the roof of the shed and the shed had to go but we kept the roof so we kept the um, certain elements that were already on site and the strategy to take elements away, this is something I'm showing you here, is basically if you have a industrial hall, often the halls are very deep, right? So they, they um, you don't have a lot of light in there. And if you wanna um, make a more, a use that needs more light, like uh, offices or kindergarten or so on, you can take away elements. So you can take away a wall and then you have sort of a, a open space with a roof or you take also take the roof away and then you have a courtyard. This is or you just basically in the middle of the building, you add a courtyard in order to create um, different zones, different quality zones in a in a building that has a lot of um, a long um, dimensions. So these are images of the Gundeldinger Feld, where we, this is still the structure of a, a roof. So there was a roof here before, but we took the roof away and basically made new facades in here and created these courtyards. The same here, so we keep, we keep the, uh, let's say the, the, the structure, so we keep the characteristics of what was there be before but we create um, more exterior space, more air and more light for the new purpose of this site. Another strategy that we, that we sort of apply if, if we wanna uh, keep things, uh, keep maximize uh, what we keep, so to say, is that we really question the current aesthetics like um, this is a picture of um, um, a staircase in in um, in Liestal in the Ziegelhof where we just say okay yeah this is from the 60s you know this is this old PVC and it's totally lost its color and it's an old railing and so on but actually is it not just okay you know can we not just keep it uh, longer we just question the, uh, the, you know, the current sense of always feeling the need to make things look better or modern or different. Sometimes it's just okay the way they are. And here, this is also uh, an example from from Zurich, <clears throat> from the Werk of Binz, where we um, just say, okay, you know, if we if we change things like here we have we there's a schreinerei like a wood shop in here and we needed uh, another story so we basically only repair right we we basically add a staircase we only replace the wood that is rotten so to say we add we add some windows but the most of it we just keep, and and this just creates a certain a certain style, you know, or just a certain yeah, just being able to or just be willing to accept um, a not so perfect look. And sometimes it takes us some time to actually convince the carpenters. Like here, the carpenters would say, "Ah, oh, come on, this just the, why don't you just replace everything?" And sometimes it takes a bit of 
even of effort to to um, convince the the companies that are involved in, in the projects and then tell them that it's just fine if it looks like that. <laughs> and so when we combine these strategies, um, a lot of a lot of areas that that maybe seem to be you know not appropriate or seem like they don't work anymore for the new purposes it might just be different right we can densify uh, by adding whole building elements we can uh, add stories and so we we, re we reuse the whole site we, re we reuse the buildings as much as we can and then we the materials we add we try first to see what's already on site what can we keep or give a new purpose to that material and then we say okay what is missing and then we have another option to to find um, existing material and give them a second life on this site um, to maximize sort of the reuse on all kinds of levels And now, like I said before, since a few years, we now uh, sort of um, um, give gave more importance to to the fact to uh, to reuse things. So we said, okay, uh, we're gonna try now to basically make whole new buildings or building elements out of reused materials, and we. We learned a lot, like we, we learned a lot, we spent a lot of time, uh, a lot of unpaid time just for us to kind of understand the new, the new needs and the new, almost the new strategies that we have to apply in order to make that work. Because, um, you know, what do we even find and how, how can we um, use, use, use that let's say old material in the new conditions we have. We have new laws, we have new regulations, new energy demands. How is that even going to work? And especially when we consider that we work, we are in Switzerland, so we have very high labor costs. And these days material is almost, has almost no price, right? Compared to earlier times. In earlier times, it was the other way around. The material was very expensive and, and really valuable and the labor cost was low. And now we have these uh, um, these different um, conditions where the labor costs is so high that every little adjustment you make on a on a material uh, makes it brings it to a point where it's financially almost um, not feasible anymore. OK, so I'm going to show you um, a couple of projects. We, this is a project in Basel. This is where we would have gone together to look at. So this is also a, um, an interesting project in the sense that it it's a, a building from the 80s and it used to be um, an industrial building. It, it used to be uh, for the co-op, uh, the, the, you know, not micro, but co-op. And, and it used to be the place where they made all the um, uh, bread. So there were all these bread making, bread baking machines in there and also huge delivery um, um, areas where the trucks would come in and pick up all the buns and so on. And this site got, gets all uh, redeveloped in Basel. It's one of these big trans, transformation areas in Basel. And um, Immobilien Basel Stadt. So the city of Basel basically bought this area and they will transform these buildings. So this building here um, is going to be a school and this building is going to be a, um, a building for business and culture. So you can see this is the building here, the green part is what we're talking about. It's a very you know, on let's say not very attractive building, right? It's from the 80s and it's a purely industrial building. Um, and you can see here too, this is a, um, a aerial view now of that building. It's by 80 by 80 meters, so it's quite large. 
And um, in order here, we also applied the strategy to create a, a courtyard in order to make more um, floor space that has access to light and air and is sort of more attractive for for um, as a workspace. And so what we did here is that we basically um, created this this facade out of mostly reused materials. So we'll talk about that in detail in a little bit. And the other thing is that we try to keep the, the maximum of the building. We have we made this corridor, like I just said, we insulated the walls, we insulated the roof. And we were able to add a huge um, PV on top here because, um, you know, it's just this huge flat roof like these industrial halls have. So um, we could do this and we would use the power straight in the in the building then. And this is a, um, a image now that shows the like this black part here, this is what this building used to run against. So they were all connected when they were still the co-op uh, place. And now they had to, we had to take a back section of the building. Pardon? Yeah, we had to take back a section of the building because this will become the school here. And this will be uh, our um, office and cultural building. So we cut back a piece and now we have this opening here, which is about uh, 100 meters long. So, you know, 80 meters long. And um, so this this facade and also the, the courtyard together are about a thousand square meters of wall. So it's a it's a fair amount. And um, we said then okay we would like to start um with this facade and use reused material and at first the owners weren't very excited about that for them it was more like a you know a building where they don't have, want to invest a lot of money like it's not like in a school you know for a school it has to look pretty and it's for the students and so on so so already there the, the city is, is willing to spend much more money than on on something like that uh, on like an industrial building um so we we sort of had to convince them in the beginning we said okay look we're going to try to do this within the normal schedule of the of the building so a normal um time we're not gonna like delay we're not we don't want to have any delays because we don't find material or something that was not an option and it was also not an option to be much more expensive than a, just a standard facade that they would build there so that was the challenge for us because we had no idea how much time it's going to take us and what the whole process will be to create a facade out of reused material. So we made a lot of um, we made a lot of uh, um, let's say designs and, and try to say, OK, look, we have on site, we have these materials, some of the materials already. Why don't we use these and so on? I'm not going to talk about all that. But I'm just going to tell you what we ended up doing. What we ended up doing is that we we um, looked for windows that were basically um, new. We weren't allowed to use old windows because of the owners. But what we did is we looked for new windows that were sort of wrong, pro pro wrongly produced and not wrongly produced in the sense of um, the their quality but in the sense of them being manufactured a bit too wide or too high, which happens all the time. And usually these windows can't, uh, will never be used and they often just get trashed because nobody knows what to do with them. And at some point they, they are in the corner of the manufacturer and they're in the way and they just kick them out. So we, we said, okay, we're going to collect all these windows and, um, we use material that's already on site, like this facade and, and these 
elements they were before on the roof of the building. And then we was we realized that in order to make it work, that we have a structure to that can um, handle all these individual window sizes, we came up with a wood construction that can just sort of work around these these windows. And then um, the rhythm here, we just took from the building that was already there. So if you turn the building 90 degrees, you've, you've seen that before, that's just the way the building looked. And uh, we, you know, we had to talk to the city um, people if they liked the style and so on. So it, but all that went back and forth too, but this is just the way um, it looks now. And so we, we have 200 different windows that we collected. This is Basel. We collected them within a reasonable radius from the construction site. It was quite surprising, actually, how quickly we found 200 brand new windows. <laughs> it's kind of scary. <laughs> we also collected insulation material that is sort of left over because you might know that a lot of times the insulation material comes in in uh, certain sizes and then it gets glued on the wall and then if it's too wide the pieces get cut off. So these cut off pieces we collected so it's also new material. And then we also collected wood. This is from a, a fire. There was a fire close by and they had to replace the whole roof and so we uh, collected these wood beams that were still okay and um, transformed them into these elements here on the on the um, in the in the module. So this is a module. This is the width and this is the height. Here's these different windows. These are the insulation pieces and some of the wood has been reused. Uh, it's reused wood like you said like you've seen before from these from this old roof but then we were running out of time we uh, had to have about half of the wood is basically wood from swiss forests because we were yeah we were running out of time we didn't have enough time to look for more reused wood pieces so these are this is how the modules were made in the company in their shop and um they also had to be convinced a little bit that that uh, in the beginning that they try this with us. It was a bit they were worried about nails in the wood beams and they said, oh, all our machines are going to crack. And and um, so in the end, it, it was easier than they thought. So they made us a very high offer just for the mock up and we but we agreed on it. And then they realized, OK, look, it, it was much easier than they thought. and we actually paid for the mock-up much less than we originally had an offer for. And then this is how the elements get brought to the construction site. But then, you know, they once they're once they're done, once they're full elements, it's it's a total standard process, uh, construction process. This is about where we are now, so we're almost done. Um, This is a picture of the interior courtyard. I guess I have to speed up a bit, huh, Bertrand, with my... <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe just a little... I see you have I, 52 slides. Bertrand, uh, how, what is the, the, the time frame for the lecture? Well, we had planned like an hour between 11 and 12, but, uh, I mean... But I think, I mean, I think it's not so... For, for me, it's, it's OK if it goes over. Okay. Maybe I just, uh, let's say, if, if it goes over and then the session with the class will go, maybe I'm not sure I will be able to be present in the <clears throat> all reviews because I have to take a baby at 2, 2 or 3 p.m. But uh, I think it's an interesting lecture. And I don't know if the students do not, students and our guests, if they don't have uh, <clears throat> oppositions, I would not uh, rush. I think it's better to to hear it uh, properly, Kirsten. Okay. And I think that uh, yeah, I think it's a different uh, 
it's not that we are in the room and we have to run now to another class or to lunch or something. So I would continue it in a normal pace. I don't know what students think, but I think it's fine. Guys, what do you think? Do you think we should continue normal pace, no? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think we have time. <laughs> yeah, everyone has time. <laughs> okay, Kirsten, don't, don't rush. Uh, do yourself how you would uh, want to do, okay? Okay, great. Okay, I'll just keep going then. Okay, so now I would I want to show you the next um, the next project that we did, which which was basically the most let's say radical attempt that we uh, tried. We basically sort of created our own pilot project by saying, okay, if we wanna this is in winter tour now on the Lagerplatz, and we said, okay, we want to have a three story addition to this existing building. And we want to make it fully out of reuse material from construction sites or from basically buildings that are dismantled uh, close by. And um, the, the why would we even do that? I think it's it's important to understand that basically Barbara Buser, the woman who founded our company and the Bauteil Börse 26 years ago, she and her friend, um, Clara Kloisler, who they founded the Bauteil Börse together. And Clara Kloisler now was in the Stiftung Abendrot, the guys who owned the, the Lagerplatz in Winterthur. So they owned the whole site. And those women together basically said, OK, come on, we're going to do this. Because I think you need really need, um, you know, you, your heart needs to be to beat for that topic. Otherwise, you would just not do that because it was it was a total experiment and um, we didn't even know how it's going to look like, right? Because we had no idea what we're going to find. And so we just started. Um, and I'm just saying this because, you know, now we, we, we learned a lot and we understand now that it's you can have very different approaches on on handling that topic. like. I think now we are in a position where we can say we know now about so much material and we have a network and we have resources that now we know we could probably do a more or less standard design, a more or less standard building design and be sure that we find the material we need. But here, like in these first projects, we were more like, OK, let's see what we find and then we will work with what we find. So what? How how did we even start? We we we're back in Liesbüchel now. We're back in Basel. Uh, at this, this is a neighboring building of of that I just showed you where we made the facade. We were on that site and we we're like, oh look, they take this whole construction down. And this this whole building was only seventeen years old, and they they took it down because you know new owner, new purpose. This building was in the way. So we saw this and we we're like, oh, maybe we can just use this whole structure as the main structure for our addition in Winterthur. So we checked and we, we were like, okay, great. You know, we can take it apart. It's only it's only screwed, right? And and then it was a big challenge to um, find you know, find a structural engineer who uh, within a very short time can even evaluate the, the beams that are there and evaluate if they would work on our on our new building. So so we did that. We found somebody and and I'm showing you this because this is now um, basically these beams that we took from Basel. This is the, the model of how we use them then in winter tour. And all the green beams are basically used one to one. So we could just keep them as they were. And the ones in red, those we had to adjust um, uh, a bit. And I'm showing this because again, the, the, the best thing is not to adjust the material just because of cost reasons. Um, so here, this is down here is the existing building and then the top floors are square and this this one ha is at an angle and we did that because um, basically the, the structure we found informed then the way 
the addition will look because we didn't want to change much. So only this the roof here basically is tilted. I don't know if you can see that. And then the, the addition on top here sticks out a bit and it's just a square sitting on top. And then we were also looking for material, you know, how do you even find it? So what we did is basically biking around and when we were going through the cities, we just saw buildings that are taken down or we saw signs that they will be taken down and then we actively um, tried to find out who owns it and uh, if we can, um, if we can basically get the stuff from them or buy it from them. So we found um, whole huge external staircases over several floors. We found this building Orion in, in Zurich, which was um, taken down after only 28 years. And they had all these facade panels and all these windows that were built such that we they were easily, um, we could easily dismantle them and work with them. And one lesson that we learned there is that um, you know, if you, let's say, want to harvest building material, uh, it's you have to look where the low hanging fruits are, <laughs> just to keep talking in this image, because here we only dismantled the, the windows on the first floor here where we could still do it by hand and with a ladder. But there is like more, there's like three more stories going up, but we couldn't really easily dismantle them without having a scaffolding. And as soon as you then start having a scaffolding and so on, it gets very expensive again. So for us, it meant, OK, low hanging fruits, first row. That was enough windows for us. So we took these ones. And then this is an image from uh, Usta. It's a, it's a city close by. And we learned that they are taking down a whole printing facility. And so we uh, we were able to get the um, facade uh, panels here. And this is also interesting because this then already was basically the color of our uh, addition. <laughs> we, we, we were lucky enough to find material that then the, the um, city accepted as um, close enough to the existing brick buildings on, on site. And also the owner is called Stiftung Abendrot, which has the color red in their name. So we kind of <laughs> told them, look, it's great. We found the exact right color for you guys. <laughs> so we, we got this and then we were on site and then we saw all this roof. So in the end, we also got, we could take the whole roof here, the, all the stones and even the insulation below the roof it was luckily not glued it was just it was just sitting on a foil and so um, we were able to take that and this sort of came along because we were already on site and we saw oh what else is there you know and then we could also get these materials we also got these windows and so in the end uh, bit by bit we found all these um, these things, right? We had the facade, we found these windows, then we, we took sort of historic windows from these old industrial halls. And um, of course, these ones are not according to the current energy codes. So these ones, we, um, we came up with systems to double them up. So they are sort of like a modern version of these windows that they used to have a uh, hundred years ago these double pane win these you know these windows that have a, a space between them i don't know how the word is in english <laughs> it's called kastenfenster in german um and then this this whole roof we got from there and then uh this is the this staircase and um Granite from the facade we took here for for flooring and the other windows and so on. So we even found a used PV, so photovoltaic. Then we found a photovoltaic that had to be dismantled because it was uh, a contracting thing and they were running out of the contract 
you know, the contracts always go for 10 or 20 years and then sort of you rent the roof to put a PV on and then when the contract runs out, you might be forced to take the PV off. So that's what we had. And and the, but they were still so good, these modules, that the contracting company installs them a second time in our building on their own risk, right? Because it's again a contracting model. So we just pay for the power we get and they take all the risk of of these models, but they th they say they're still awesome after 20 years. Okay, so this is this is how it looks like, and we can about let's say about 80% of the material is reused here. The rest we had to add new, mainly for fire reasons, because it's, you know, you can see it's a high building, so there's a lot of high demands on, on fire safety, and that was the main reason that forced us uh, to uh, add materials or, or um, concrete on the floor and so on to make it fire fireproof. And this is now a mock-up from the facade, where you can see how um, how the facade is put up, put together. So this is the uh, the, um, the facade panels. These are these windows. This is all reused. This wood is reused. These are this comes from construction site. This is uh, usually the the boards that they use um, for scaffolding. And then at some point they just get replaced and we could just use them as a sort of structure to hold the straw bale. So the insulation will be straw bale. And uh, on the inside, which you can see a little bit, we, we just basically have this granite, granite that used to be on a, a facade panel. We use those as the floor. Um, and this, I think for us, like from an um, environmental perspective, we think that this is really a very promising path to go. So you basically, in order to reach the, our climate goals and, and the whole CO2 footprint of the building industry um, to lower that, right? Because the CO2 footprint of the building industry is just huge and it's very resource in intensive. And basically we have not really a clear understanding how to reach the climate goals in the construction industry. And so this is um, a very promising way because we work with stuff that's already there, right? I mean, the, the material's already there, the CO2 is already emitted, we just prolong the lifespan of these things if we can. Then we add with other materials that have a low CO2 content. And then the next challenge is to bind them in a way uh, so we can take them apart again and basically return them at a later point in time into their cycles, right? Turn them into uh, another recycling process or um, basically be able to compost them or, or turn them into an uh, organic cycle. And we've, we've been doing uh, calculations on this and uh, we are involved in also research projects that work with reuse now because um, we've just found that this um, the impact that we can have with reuse is so large that it's really a strategy that I think will just pick up now um, that people will will really focus on that much more um, because the the results are so convincing on what how much co2 we can actually save if we if we build that way Um, so Bertrand uh, told me that um, you guys are also interested in in basically learning about the tools and how we even how do we even do this and how do we uh, how can what have we sort of invented as tools yes. to handle this. So I'm going to show you a few tools here that we used. So the classic plans 
in architecture, you have black for existing, you have yellow for what you take away, and you have red for what you add. And so where an uh, easy way for us to handle this was um, that we split up the red in basically orange and pink. <laughs> and what it means is that we split up the, the elements that we need in the ones that we already have and the ones we're already looking for, we're still looking for. Because we start planning and we don't have all the materials yet, right? We, when we start planning, so we did it in this project. We started planning. We didn't have all the materials yet. We knew, okay, there are certain materials that are very uh, important. They're sort of the, the, the core, right? If I don't have them, I can't continue my planning, which is, for example, the structure. Only if I know I have the structure and I have this room height and so on, it makes even sense to keep going, looking for other elements. Also important is the, um, uh, the Erschließung, like the staircase and the elevator. You know, if I, these are sort of critical to know the room heights. And we also realized, for example, with staircase and elevator, that we can take them apart from each other. So meaning that an elevator can always stop at any height. And if I find a staircase, a staircase has sort of a given height, but I can add a stair or two in order to accommodate a different floor height to an existing staircase. So that's what we ended up doing. We ended up having an elevator inside that, that for handicapped people accesses every floor at the exact right height. But for the staircase, we did actually end up adding steps to come in and out of the individual floors so, because we say, okay, if a person can walk a step, the stairs anyways, they can also add another step, right, to go in and out of the floors. So this is, for example, some, some things that we did, right? We, we, we took certain, um, um, let's say, elements apart from each other so that they can work individually. And then with what we had, we, we say, okay, this is what we have, and now we can look for others, right? We can now look for windows uh, when we know how high they can be. So this is a, a way how we handle the, 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 the plan design. And then with the, the components themselves, we basically made a sort of a catalog. We cataloged them, we labeled them, we made um, put dimensions on them, and we we build our own sort of shop. It's like a, a building component shop that we have. So it's um, a shop that basically it has all the categories of bit different building times, types like windows, stairs, lamps, and whatnot. And then we uh, have a photo. We have a little drawing uh, that, that has the dimensions and the information. And then we also basically say, how many do we have? Where are they located? Because we, we have to collect. In order to really plan with the material, I need to basically own it, right? I need to make sure that, we, that I have it. Because <laughs> so otherwise I'm going to plan with something I, I can't be sure I'm having. Because it's not like a standard process where I just design everything and then I just order it and then it just comes cut into the size and shape that I want to the right time on the construction site. It's a very different process. I need to I need to I need to basically have the material and I need to be sure that I have it available to the right time. And for the project in Winterthur we then had storage space and so we needed to know where is the storage and who is basically the person who knows about it and so on. So we build our own sort of little shop. And another thing that we learned is that basically once you once, once you look into that, you're just going to be amazed how much material there is and how much stuff gets torn down and thrown away. It's just really wild. And you, you will see that you have so much material available that you 
really need to choose what kind you want. And and then there's different ways to look at that. You know, do you want it all to be the same? Then it's much easier for the log logistics. Or do you want just things that are, you know, that are um, very surprising? So it's a very individual kind of a very special kind of piece in there. And then you also need to understand the properties of the material. You need to know what you're looking for and you need to know what the properties are. So let's say if you look for a window, you need to understand, you know, what size can the windows be because of the, the space, right? The room, like if I, if I build an office, I need to have a certain percentage of my facade needs to be opaque. So I need to have a certain amount of glazing in there. And then I need to, for example, understand the U value, like the energetic categories of the window. So, so that um, if I have, let's say, a window that's not according to the current codes, I need to, I can still use it, but then I, I have to compensate. So I need to have a good wall, right? And my wall needs to be, let's say, at a, a high energetic um, uh, value so that it can, it can um, compensate my window that is not so good and so on. So it's good to have a, a good understanding of what you're actually looking for and what you need before you start collecting material because otherwise you end up with all that stuff <laughs> and you you might end up not needing it and then um, in order to sort of also understand how is it they're going to look like right because you, you start collecting all these materials but sort of parallel to that you need to uh, understand um, make these images to uh, create a design or a style that you sort of like, right? So so how is this even going to work? You know, now I have this window from this uh, place and can I can I take elements out and make a door in there and so on? So it's 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 sort of a constant loop of finding materials and and adjusting your your design, um, uh, so so they they work together, and another thing that we realized is if if you if you then find find the materials, um, then they're most always too short or too long, <laughs> so it's very rare that they just fit right. And so what we did is, for example, in, in this building, uh, we basically stacked, we layered things. So we said, OK, if I, I have a window, that's sort of given. So I need to put my wall around that and my wall I can I can sort of make right because there again, I have a, a system with wood and straw so I can sort of adjust that. And I put the window in, but then if I have if I find um, shading that's a bit larger than the window i might be able to just kind of work with that and and um and add it there and then if i have a the metal from the facade i can sort of stagger that on top again so i it can have a different length so what we ended up doing here with the facade is that it's almost um, it's layered right it has all these it has these layers, one level sits on top of the other, just so that we can keep the um, these metal pieces the length that they already were, and we don't have to cut them all. And then that means that it's sort of the, the design is basically always, it's always a, a loop, right? You, you just, you have an idea how you want it, and then you find the material, and then it ha you might have to adjust it a bit, right? It's a bit higher, or it's a bit wider, or you just um, so 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 it's basically a, a constant loop, and there's always a bit of um, a bit of adjustment. And 
And this was in the end really very time consuming. You can probably imagine that. I mean, that was really, um, it took us a lot, a lot, a lot of time. And um, I think it was, it, it, it's great that we did that and it's we, we learned a lot. And uh, I think now from this, all these things we learned, we can sort of step back a bit now and basically in the next step, we want to find systems and ways that really uh, are, are quite efficient and and that that work well and are sort of repetitive. So meaning that I can see us um, working, for example, the next time with, let's say, a wood structure, right? That the main structure is sort of out of wood. And then I basically say, OK, I can use windows and around the I need and around that window and I use a, a, a sort of a facade system that can um, adjust to the to the windows but I don't need to make everything reuse because it's just really very complicated and I think now we are also at a point where we where we see that there is so many buildings taken down that have so much material that is the same, you know, like we have hundreds of similar win of the same window sizes or we have facade panels that are that are um, we have 200 pieces of them so that that you could have a very different design and um, find the material for that. So we're we are much more confident now than we used when than we were when we started this, when we just had no idea how, how what we're really going to find. So I would still like to show you some pictures now of the construction site. Um, this is a very cool picture. I like this a lot. It's very dense. This shows the existing uh, building on the on the floor so the, the the walls and all that that we tried to keep we had to reinforce um, the walls um, so it can carry the, the, the load coming from this addition we made and so you can see here how we just how it just kind of grows right it just grows here was a door before we took the door out but we keep the wall and we add we add what's needed to reach the new um, dimensions of the of the floor height. This is uh, the existing wall, and here on on these segments we had to reinforce uh, with concrete. And here you can see this is the existing building. This will all the, the facade will all keep, and the windows will keep. And on the inside will will um, will add insulation and a second layer of window panes just to reach the thermal requirements, the energetic requirements of today. And here is uh, the, the steel structure put in place. Here you can see this angle coming out that we did just so we can, we can keep all these beams the way they are and we don't have to cut them all. So here it's popping up slowly and these are the this is a trapeze uh, which we use um, now as um, a part of the floor so on top of this we will we will add more um, concrete in our case to um, to have the to have the, the new floors and the concrete we had to use we didn't want that but we had to again, for fire safety reasons. So, okay, now I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna quickly go through the impact hub because I'm realizing I'm, I'm uh, talking a lot, <laughs> too long. <laughs> okay, so quickly, this is the impact hub in Basel. This is a building from the 90s. It's uh, interesting because it's pink and purple. And um, we were, helping here the main job was the job for interior and interior architects firm and they asked us to help them for the structural stuff so interior architects are bravoriki in basel and we have worked with them in other projects already and i think they've done a 
a really cool job. So this is the interior. It used to be a, um, a place for um, server, like um, IT, IT business. And you can still see here the raised floor of the floor above. So this here, this is the former ceiling. And we just cut out a hole here in order to put in these stairs and um, make it more ac accessible now on the on the two floors. So this is the old floor. They just cut that open and just left it all very raw and all really visible. You still you see here the old radiator and the old the windows, how they used to be, which now doesn't make any sense anymore in the facade, but that's just how it was. And here, this staircase, for example, this is a reused staircase. It used to go around the corner like that, 90 degrees, chuck, chuck. And then we found somebody who made a straight staircase out of it. And then because it was too short, he just added some stairs here. And then um, this is also on the inside, basically took out a whole uh, restaurant. There was an old restaurant in Basel um, that the building got torn down and they set, salvaged the whole, it, all of the interior and even the whole facade panels and the stairs and basically everything. And they put in a zero waste cafe here. So here again, you can see this, here's the staircase. This is the cafe. Here's where they, where we opened the, we took the floor out. This is the old, the old raised floor. And here's the, lowered ceiling and they just really very rough, right? They just took out uh, ceiling elements here and and left it very, very raw. The in, in inside, they just ripped out the carpet but left the floor like that and they made, we, we had to make some openings and, and um, it's all been, so all the changes basically have been left visible. This is a conference room. So here you see the raised floor. That's they still left it here in some pieces. Here they made um, a little staircase uh, down, like some steps. And all the furniture here is all reused. So they collected all these things from uh, sort of Pockenstube, secondhand stores. And here too, I find I, I just really like that. Right? They just they put in this this light uh, structure and okay, ceiling is in the way. We'll just take out a uh, panel and put it right through. Doors again, they just make the, these openings and leave it all very uh, visible. Here we cut out a a piece um, of the concrete to make a door. And then what we did is that we put the door in, this is a, a door for fire safety. So we, we just basically put the frame on the wall so that this whole door can be dismantled again later and maybe maybe put somewhere else because they most likely this building is just gonna stay for another 10 years. So um, we when we when we work now, we also try to as much as we can basically build such as we can take the things out again. This is like a normal consequence. You know, if you work with reused material, you automatically uh, try to build so that the material you're working with now can be reused again at a later point in time. So I'm coming back to this picture because I just like these guys, Encore Heureux, and just to show what can, what can, is another option that can be done with doors is for example this. I like this a lot. I don't know, maybe you know this. It's a little pavilion that they made in Paris out of 180 doors. So that's it. <laughs> that was mm, my. Thank you very much. Yes, it was very interesting. And um, I, I would like to, to uh, see if uh, our students have uh, questions, general questions. Because more particular questions, uh, you can uh, ask. Uh, uh, you can ask Kirsten uh, if I uh, if I'm correct. You you can find some time. Maybe we can make a pause 
and then make uh, in a small meetings with the students yeah. who can present you uh, th their work. Guys, I propose that when you present your work, don't don't present it like on the jury, like uh, uh, like oh we research this and this. Be very quick and efficient, and go directly to like if you have a questions or if you have some options. So don't make it. I'm speaking now to students. Don't make it like a full presentation, right? So try to put it like uh, in less than five minutes. You can skip lots of information. We we are not in the jury now. It's more like to have a feedback than to present your work, right? So skip the non-important things or the things which are maybe not relevant uh, and which, uh, I don't know, like, uh, so I hope you understand the, the mode. Um, and um, I have a, I have a small question, which is more from my, uh, I will start uh, with question, which is more from my <coughs> own curiosity. I have seen online that Bau Bureau in situ will be involved in the renovation of uh, Roche buildings or on the new buildings of Roche. Yeah. And if, if you could comment on this, uh, it's a very big uh, development in Basel, and it was always supposed to be by uh, done by Herzog Demeron, which yeah. is a very... <laughs> so we would like, uh, just would like to know, and uh, because I thought that, yeah, uh, I just had some ideas that if, if they uh, hired you in, instead of Herzog, that it's a paradigm shift that like a big uh, corporate clients, they start to understand the, the value of what you your office has been uh, researching and doing. So could, is there some uh, like uh, information you could share about this or not? You know, um, you know, Lenny, it's quite funny because it was actually an April Fool's joke. <laughs> <laughs> we only had that on there very briefly. And it, it's quite funny because I think the newspaper, the, the, the guys who wrote that, they did such a good job. I mean, I read the thing and it just made total sense. Like you read it and you're like, yeah, that sounds really good. <laughs> you know, heritage protection and put that back in and so, but it was, it was actually, unfortunately, really only uh, an April Fool joke. <laughs> uh, uh, really? <laughs> Oh no! I know we. I, it would. It would have been fun, but you know, I don't know. That's I. I it would have been cool, but I think it's still a ways to go. <laughs> ah, so, so it's not uh, because you were breaking up. It's not happening. It's an April Fool joke. Yeah. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> okay, because many. Okay, then. Um, Okay, maybe then let's go to questions from uh, students from Bertrand and uh, also we have some guests here. I don't know how many. I know for sure we have uh, Angelica and Manon who are uh, our colleagues. Uh, Angelica is from Zurich and Manon is also from HEAD, but mm -hmm. she's, she's from another atelier. Maybe there is some other people because this lecture was um, published online. So I don't know how active I see that there is maybe 20 people. In the so guys, if someone has questions to Kerstin regarding her lecture, please uh, feel free to ask now. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you. Um, my question is regarding to Switzerland, um, because I know that in in France, in Paris, they are kind of receptive uh, to reemploi. They, they try, but I know there is also a lot of uh, people that don't like it or are against it. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to know if it's Switzerland, uh, because also the Madovri is a lot more expensive, etc. Uh, how do you feel the re-emploi in Switzerland? Are people are uh, interested in to work with it or is it a bit difficult? Yeah, you know, I think it's um, I think it's coming. I think it's coming because people understand um, more and more just that for environmental reasons, it's uh, we just need to change the way we we build. And I think um, we're we're slow, right? It's slow because uh, let's say. A lot of people tell, say, tell us, you know, what you do is like bricolage and it just doesn't look good, you know, kind of not not it doesn't look good, but it goes in that direction. You know, it's like um, it has just has nothing to do with like classics with minimalism or whatever. 
And I I agree, you know, I can I can totally I see that. I see that argument, but I think that we are now, like I said before, we are now in a position where we see that there is a lot of material uh, around and we can, we we feel now that we could it could be a much cleaner design if people want that, even with reused material. It could even be reused material that you don't even see, right? Because you don't always have to see it. I mean, in the in these wood modules, like in in the in Bas the Basel project, I mean, you see all these different windows. Okay, so that's clear. That's sort of that's sort of uh, a specific uh, style, you know, or or that's something odd you don't see, but the elements themselves that we reused wood and that we reused insulation nobody sees that that's not even visible and now we are as a company we're actually considering to start a new company and the goal of the new company would basically be to support others uh, other architectural companies to um, apply reuse in their own work so because we realized we for us it's very much an idealistic approach and we really for us it, the, the environmental aspect is very important and we understand that we it doesn't help if we clap on our shoulder and say great you know we did two projects reuse or three or four it doesn't make an impact on a bigger scale so if we want to make an impact on a bigger scale we need to address many 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 more people and sort of convince them and um, this is already going on now. So we're already starting now to actually support other architectural offices with their projects and find material for them or give them advice in what they could reuse, what they couldn't. And we try to work with their aesthetics, you know, with their sense of aesthetics and sort of um, give them ideas how it could work. And so this is one side and we actually start working with other architects. And the other aspect is that we, we start being approached from companies that have an interest in, um, in, in making a change in that field. So we are now basically talking to a, a wood manufacturer that, um, might be able that we sort of do with them um, that we work with with materials that come out of a production process. So there's this constant stream of 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 wood pieces that usually get trashed or burned. And he says, okay, look, if you give me a good design, and this is something for you for you in your project, I think could also be interesting to think of if. He says, if you give me a good design for a floor or for an inter internal wall panel, it doesn't take me much effort to cut these wood pieces into a specific shape or size or width. Mm. And even put, you know, put little things on it so you can actually attach it easy. Um, so, so I think there is an interest also in the trades that um, that we can come up with new solutions now. And uh, and that's what we're working on, right? We're going to send a person from our office to that factory for a week so that together we can sort of invent and design um, elements and products that work with reuse uh, material. Uh, and I think there is just a lot of, a lot of potential and it's just only opening up now, I think. Mm. Um, but Kirsten, um, I was thinking also, you, you were talking about uh, the amount of resource that you have in the office. You were talking about also uh, the notion of time that you take um, to, to adjust uh, according to material that you find. And all these kind of uh, uh, elements that kind of promotes and also uh, create possibilities to do reused and uh, reemploi uh, buildings. Is also sometimes for could be a, some sort of a you, uh, a blockage or like a wall to to design quickly or in, and I was wondering if this is only in our minds 
or uh, because of course to to have an office like Bar Bureau must have taken a lot of time to put in place uh, to have those connections to find the materials to have this kind of attitude of curiosity to find where people people are storing their things and how to uh, pick them up and then there's the next part which is uh, the design part which also takes a lot of time to adjust materials and to uh, do the drawing at the same time and I was wondering um, if um, yeah, how could we make all of this more accessible uh, for that the design or the process of designing at least could be uh, somehow not a scary part, but actually uh, enjoyable and, uh, and maybe somehow because you said that the, the, the value of labor uh, increased, uh, it's much more expensive also to, to, to take time to, to produce work uh, than in the past. And um, I was wondering if, if somehow uh, those resources could be more accessible and if yes how yeah you know i think i think we also just need better tools like we're also working yeah. on um we're working on like several levels now right we're working on uh, there's a lot of material out there and there's a lot of little players out there yeah. and we are sort of thinking you know we should create sort of like a um, a meta search engine that basically yeah. like like a kayak for travel places okay. you know that basically yeah. brings in all these these different offers and then we could also um you know if we have good programmers we could start programming tools that basically automatically suggest other materials that will work with the one that you already have like in any clothing online clothing shop you have that right yeah, you have little yeah. windows other people bought or whatever yeah. and i think we need tools like that that make it that make it much um easier uh, to access and yeah. then i think it needs more players right i mean we're yeah. talking here about resources we are talking here about avoiding trash and we need to kind of address all these other players like any city should have an interest in providing storage space for materials because they save um how do you say deponie you know like yeah. all the communities are running out of space where to put their trash and this is going to become a huge issue because yeah. you know, no little village and no town wants wants the trash in front of their house and no china is going to take our trash anymore no you know all this stuff i mean we're just it it has all these other aspects to it that we usually don't think of but if we if we i think if we make a stronger network and look at the whole picture better i think we can on a broader scale find other groups and people and interests and then sort of all work together from all these different angles that are that are relevant and then i think we can we can move forward so for example we are also working to try to get co2 certificates for reused materials right because it's it's clear right i mean every material has an embodied energy and embodied carbon in it and if I'm not trashing this and I'm not burning it, but I put it in another building, I'm giving, I'm prolonging its lifespan and I'm, and another product does not have to be built because I'm using this one. And so you could, you could basically create a, a income, a, a source of income um, for reuse material. And it's basically a carbon price, right? And I think these are all tools that need to be developed and it needs to come right but i'm i'm pretty sure it will because it sort of has to i don't know how else we can we can look forwards really and and then um i think we need we need a strong network now and and bind um bind all these interests together yeah um i don't know if anyone else have uh, other questions maybe people that are yes, yes. yes. I also have a question. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks very much. It was really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, did you already started like your own storage with stuff that you find during one project that you 
think you could use for another one or do you restart searching materials that you can use for each project um, all over again or do you already have some storage where you know ah, we already have these windows so we can use these for another project and another question is when you started like as you told, you saw that there is a whole building that got deconstructed and you wanted to use the structure for your work in Winterthur. Mm -hmm. um, like, if you negotiate with the owner, I imagine if there is a new owner, he wants to destroy and rebuild something totally new. Are these people willing to, to give these materials because the deconstruction is a lot more takes a lot more time if you want to use the individual materials. Like, are these people willing to spend this additional time or how is the negotiation going with these people? Yeah, I mean, so um, for, your, for your second question first, um, the, you know, you, yeah, it's a negotiation because usually, um, for example, right now, we're trying to find um, steel beams from power lines that will become um, the, the outside uh, walkways around the building, right? So we're, we're, we're trying to find um, power lines that are deconstructed, right? These poles. And now, okay, then the thing is usually <laughs> there's all these contracts in places and the material is already these guys own it, those guys take it apart and then they sell the material to those guys and they have then a, a certain value to that. They have the value because it's if it's a metal, it has a value, right? It's because you can melt it and then make something yeah. out of it. So it has a value. And then, then you need to pay them the value of the material. That's what they don't get if they give it to you. So that's one thing. And then usually you have to pay them the, the extra work that they dismantle it such as you can reuse it and they that they don't come down all bent and you know splintered so yeah. and then you have a, a second thing is the transport they must transport it somewhere and then you must have a storage space and these are sort of these there's certain components that you then need to consider and then it's basically a bargaining you know you have to it's a, it's a deal. I mean, you, first of all, the, the, the challenge is to get them to be willing to give it to you and to even put up with you, <laughs> disrupting yeah. their standard procedure. And then, um, yeah, and then you just have to see what's a, a fair price and and, um, and then uh, come up with, with something that works for everybody. So, yeah, so it is, I think it is, Definitely, it takes time, but then again, you know, once you've went through that process the first time, it's easier the next time. Because first time, you know what to look after and you know what the conditions are and what the arguments are and what the problems are. And then um, second of all, you can maybe start making, having a connection with people that have a will to support that type of idea. Yeah. Then the next time you can... Um, talk to them right and we're already doing this we already have companies that we know they're good in dismantling things and um and uh, they can then transport it and so you just build up your own little network and my my guess is or my feeling is that you will have more and more companies being willing to do that for environment environmental reasons and also because it's uh it's another business branch for them really you know yeah and then what you're saying regarding our own material. So we are at this point trying to avoid that because we don't want to have, we don't want to become a, a Bauteilbörse, you know, we don't, but we want to cooperate with existing places that do stuff like that. So we have the Bauteilbörse Basel, uh, for example, and they have people there that can deconstruct and that, they can move stuff to some degree, right? Because they sometimes they're not as skilled as other people are, but to some degree they can and they have storage 
And so we we rather want to establish relationships with them and have them um, do the dismantling and the storage. And we want to basically come, we basically want to achieve a point where we can sort of set up a system where we can already, let's say, order that, right? For example, now we're consulting architects and they want, let's say, 300 square meters of floor. Of re and then we, it's up to us to basically come up with ideas of how that floor could look like so it, that it's a reused floor. And then you have to start a uh, discussion with the architects. Okay, can the floor have different types of wood and can it be sort of like a mosaic floor? Is that um, okay? And if it's not, then maybe we can uh, again look at these, um, like I said before, these, these rest pieces of a um, construction process in this wood factory place and then come up with a design that then works for the architect and for the wood factory and with a price that works for everybody. I mean, that is, these are the, the things we are just basically starting to establish now and uh, to to uh, put in place. So it's all very new, but I'm, I'm, um, I'm optimistic that it's going to that it's going to work. Hmm. It's I don't think we're going to get rich, you know. I mean, this is really at this point we're not sure not going to get rich, right? But you know, it's uh, there is it. It we have all these good signs, right? We have these good signs. We have now the, the city of Zurich is asking us if we can maybe help them come up with a way. How can an architectural competition be set up so that hmm. reuse is a main element of the the competition and of the the judgment later like how how can you judge uh, how can this be a big part later in um in the decision who actually won the competition and this is happening now on on a, a few spots where we have really building owners that want to implement that topic and um this gives me hope you know i mean i don't know <laughs> okay, uh, Kerstin, if I may add another question uh, exactly in what you just talked about, uh, I find your talk very inspiring. What kind of scale do you imagine this could become if there was this, like if these positive signs that you just described were to continue and the goodwill from uh, owners, but also from communities, would really uh, go into this direction that that you are working in. Mm -hmm. What kind of scale could it could it have in in comparison to the business as usual? If you if you would describe it as such, I think you know. I think that this whole topic of like a circular economy, you know, this is just gonna. It has to come. Because we are just gonna, we are just running out of resources. We don't have the ecological resources anymore. We have a, a CO2 question to answer, and all this is basically pointing towards uh, reusing materials or using materials that have a low environmental impact. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more a question of what percentage, any building can have a certain percentage of reuse, it's no problem at all already today, you know. It's just a question, is it 5% or do you really want 80%? And I think any anything in between there is helpful at this point. And I also convinced that we will, as soon as the, let's say the energy codes will start addressing the issue of embodied energy, which now they don't, right? Mm -hmm. Now they only look at um, the, 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 the normal codes only look at the amount of energy a building consumes while it's being used, but mm -hmm. they do not look at the amount of energy we need to create the building and to get rid of that building. And certain, um, let's say, um, voluntary voluntary uh, systems like Minagi Echo or SNBS or LEED or whatever, they all um, give a value to this. 
or SCR 2040, you know, the, the mm -hmm. 2000 Watt Society, they all already look at that and they say, okay, they, we have to give this a value. And I'm, I, you know, I see that the, basically the, it sort of goes counter each other, right? I mean, the, the better my building is in running, like the less energy it needs when I run it the more material I need to create it, right? I need thicker walls, I need a better insulation. I have all these building technologies like um, ventilation system or PV and so on. And then I get a building that is very, very, very efficient, but nobody looks at the price on the other end of the, <laughs> of the line that it actually needs more energy to even make that building. And so I think we will come to a point where this will become also a, uh, a main criteria and maybe the two criteria together will become the law, the, the energy law. And then I think it will kickstart a huge um, a, a huge wave because now we are we are investigating how to even um, evaluate a reused material. What's the energy? <laughs> what is the embodied energy of a reused material? So this is the research we are involved in. And we see that uh, it's it's gonna most likely it's gonna be very 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 low. So then all of a sudden, if I need to have a certain reach a certain energy standard, and uh, every reused material I put in is counts like nothing. I mean that is just gonna be a huge Kickstarter to to um, to implement more reused stuff. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. What about the standardization of the, of the reuse material? Uh, because I know that sometimes it's more uh, so the material is um, free, kind of free, mm -hmm. but uh, the, to, to put it again in the standard to, to pass the misonorm. Mm -hmm. uh, it's expensive. So do you sometimes make a selection of the material? You take it because it's it's um, already in the norm, no? Or yeah, you see the thing is there we what we're where we're getting where we're walking towards is basically that we make a distinction um, for what do we actually want to reuse it. So if we let's say if we want to reuse a window, then um, I can reuse the window um, in the outside of a building envelope of, let's say, a house, a housing. Then, of course, this window has very high uh, criteria that it needs to fulfill on, on, let's say, an energy level. But I could also, if this is an old window, I could also make an interior partition wall out of that, win out of that window, or I could use it in um, as a window in a storage space, for example, where I don't heat at all. And so you could basically say um, the higher the, 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 the standard is for the new construction, the better it is, the younger the material is. You know, like if it's a young material, it has almost, it, it might still have, or it might have almost the requirements we need. And if it's an older material, you could still think of um, other ways to use it. You know, where where the original the original uh, criteria might not be there anymore. Mm -hmm. So so it's a question of of being creative. You know, I think it's just you have to be creative and and just come up with uh, with good ways how to use it. You know. I mean, all these doors you see on these pictures, they might have been squeaky doors, but right now it's totally fine where they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, Kirsten. I, I've, uh, if there's any of our, because our students, we still have time with Kirsten this afternoon, so maybe you can still ask her some question later, but if there's anyone uh, outside of our students who wants to ask, now is, is kind of the time. Um, otherwise, um, Otherwise, I think we should uh, take a break, uh, maybe have lunch, and then we can meet up uh, around two, if that's fine for you. 
uh, at 2 p.m. And, uh, and continue our presentations with our studio. So if anyone else doesn't want to add, um, uh, okay. Okay, well, uh, I'll, then Kirsten, we'll, con we'll call you at 2, 2 p.m. Is that okay for you? Yeah, that's great. Okay, great. Um, I don't know if uh, Javier, if you want to say something or... Uh, uh, well, no, no, no. Th thanks a lot for for putting me in. Uh, no, no. Uh, I don't have anything to to add. Uh, a real pleasure, like to to. I'm, I'm Javier Fernandez, Kirsten. Uh, I'm the head of the department uh, of interior architecture, and uh, I've been following your lecture and also the questions by by students and by the team. So thanks a lot for for joining us today and. Uh, I think you obviously it's it's a very timely uh, work and line of research uh, that you are developing at Bauburo in situ. Mm -hmm. It belongs to contemporaneity. Obviously, it's something that we have to collectively address the the challenges that you are uh, coping with uh, in Bauburo in situ. And uh, as I said before, thanks a lot for for being with us today. Thank you, Bertrana Leonid, also for for inviting Kerstin and Bauro in situ. And I hope that the afternoon will be as interesting as as the media. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank okay. you very much, uh, Kerstin. Yeah. And uh, yes, uh, thank you everyone for listening, to yeah. Kerstin. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. And if you're in Boston, just uh, give me a note. <laughs> you. Yes, we would love to. It was it was on our list, uh, Kirsten, but c'est la vie. Yeah, c'est la vie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Ciao. ciao.